Hello and good morning. It is 7am. The former Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, is calling for the government's emergency COBRA committee to sit in permanent session to try and tackle the cost of living crisis. And he's renewed his demand for an emergency budget to help families struggling to cope with rising prices. We'll be speaking to Mr Brown at 7.30 and we'll have representatives of both the Liz Trust and Rishi Sunak campaigns on the programme to find out if they agree. And we'll be live in the Taiwanese capital, Taipei, and in Jerusalem. It is Monday, the 8th of August. A ceasefire has come into force in Gaza after three days of Israeli bombardment killed at least 44 Palestinians. This Egyptian-backed ceasefire has now come into effect, but it's a temporary truce. It's not a long-standing solution. The biggest investment in stopping climate change in U.S. history. The Senate approves a $369 billion bill to reduce carbon emissions. Former Prime Minister Gordon Brown warns of a race against time to get help to those who need it most. Police arrest a fifth man in their investigation into the disappearance of the student nurse, Awami Davies. She was last seen on this road in South London on the 7th of July, more than a month ago. Children's charities say they are outraged after it is revealed that the Metropolitan Police subjected 650 children to traumatising strip searches in the last two years. The former Manchester United star Ryan Giggs is due to go on trial today, accused of attacking his ex-girlfriend. And also this morning, we'll speak to a student who found an abandoned baby in a bin during a holiday in Haiti and gave him a home. And as the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham come to a close, we'll discuss the most memorable moments of the past 11 days with the president of the Commonwealth Games Federation. Hello and thank you for being with us. A ceasefire has come into force following the worst violence between Israel and Palestinian militants since the 11-day war in 2021. At least 44 Palestinians have been killed in three days of Israeli bombardment on Gaza. Hundreds of rockets have been fired at Israel, forcing people living there into shelters, but there were no fatalities. Well, let's cross now to Jerusalem, where we're joined by John Sparks. Uh, John, good morning to you. So the ceasefire seems to be holding for now, but what's the feeling among people there? Will it continue to do so? No. Very, very uh, good question. Uh, it was negotiated yesterday while the two sides were busy trying to shoot and and bomb each other. It was announced very late last night. It was done by Egypt, who seemed to be the only party at the moment that can speak to all of the parties involved. But it is a, a temporary truce, a temporary settlement. The status quo remains uh, the same. It doesn't really change anything on the ground in Gaza and around uh, Gaza. Um, it started on Friday, this episode of uh, violence the Israelis carried out, what they called preemptive attacks on positions belonging to the second largest militant uh, group in Gaza called Islamic uh, Jihad. Uh, Islamic Jihad uh, then struck back with more than 600 rockets that they fired into Israel. Uh, we saw people scurrying for the shelters in cities like Tel Aviv and Ashkelon. Uh, and uh, a very difficult situation for people in Israel. But there were no casualties here. Not the same in Gaza. Uh, more than 44 people in Gaza, including some children, uh, have lost their lives. More than 300 people have been injured. And multiple buildings in Gaza have been destroyed destroyed as well. So the, the fear, the anger, the resentment, that all remains in Gaza. And the security concerns in Israel, that stays the same as well. But we do have, at the moment, a sort of peace. OK, John in Jerusalem for now. Thank you so much for that reporting. Thank you. Now, the former Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, is calling for daily meetings of the government's emergency COBRA committee to try and deal with the cost of living crisis. Now, he warns that a financial time bomb is due to explode on families on the 1st of October. That's when energy prices rise, and he sharply criticises both Conservative leadership hopefuls. Well, here with me now is the former Conservative Party co-chairman and supporter of Rishi Sunak. 
Oliver Dowden. Uh, Oliver, good morning to you. Thanks for being with us. Let's pick up on what we've heard from the yeah. former Prime Minister right now. A good idea to hold daily emergency COBRA meetings? Well, of course we need to be on top of this situation and we need to be realistic and honest with people about the scale of the challenge that we're facing, both with the scale of inflation that's coming down the line, something we haven't seen for almost 40 years, and with the fact that energy bills are going to go up possibly towards £4,000. I would say, though, I don't take enormous lessons from Gordon Brown. Remember, this was a man who gave the 75p rise for pensioners, so he's not really got a great record on this sort of thing. Oh, he's also the man who guided the country through the financial crash in 2008. Uh, well, we, we, we could trade stuff about Gordon Brown. He's, he's also the person that left us with no money left and uh, uh, sold the gold at the lowest price possible. So um, I think Conservatives are perfectly capable of dealing with this situation ourselves. And you've seen that Rishi Sunak did that when he was Chancellor. He announced an enormous amount of support for people uh, in expectation of this rise in energy bills, up to £1,200 for those on the lowest incomes. It's that kind of scale of direct intervention that is required. And I think uh, just uh, proposing to cut the national insurance contribution, which will only help people on the lowest incomes working full-time in the national living wage by less than £60, is not sufficient to this scale of challenge. That's a list trust idea, it's not Gordon Brown's. We'll come on to that, some of that in a moment. Do you think there should be an emergency budget then? whoever is next Prime Minister, to deal with the crisis we're facing? Uh, well, I think we need to take bold and direct action in response to this. And I think uh, you've seen from Rishi Sunak when he was Chancellor, both in response to the furlough scheme, uh, when he came up with that in a matter of days that saved millions of jobs, and the action he and uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson took earlier this year. It's that kind of scale of intervention that is required. Is that an emergency budget? Bold and direct action is one thing. An emergency budget is what's needed, isn't it? Well, these things don't necessarily have to be done through an emergency budget. Okay. So if you look at the £1,200 that was uh, uh, announced earlier this year, that wasn't through an emergency budget. But I think there is no doubt that we do need uh, an intervention of a considerable scale uh, to deal with this, because we have to be honest with people about the scale of the challenge that they're facing. So that's an acceptance, then, that the amount that was promised earlier in the year is inadequate and more money will be needed for those most in need? Yes, I think that's that's almost certainly the case. We'll have to see exactly what the, the bills end up uh, being. I mean, we, we know see, they're going to be over £3,500. Three well, pounds. let's see when we know the exact level of the price cap. But if if it looks like it's going to be at that kind of scale, then, of course, we'll need further... Intervention. So we have already seen uh, an announcement from Rishi Sunak that he would remove VAT on fuel bills temporarily to help through this crisis. But I'm sure that further action will also be required. What yes. about an increase in universal credit to help those most in need who will be suffering? Well, actually, if you, you look at universal credit, that is something that uh, Rishi Sunak was willing to do both during the, the COVID crisis when he in increased it by £20 and indeed uh, when he eased the taper rate to help people... Uh, to, to keep more of what they earn on those lower incomes. But I think that... that but then he took it away. So, I mean, we're going into another huge crisis now in the winter. Will that happen again, do you think? Well, we've been clear that support will be temporary and targeted. So the VAT cut will be temporary. When, when bills fall again, then that support won't be required. But I think the, the point about all of this is... And I think there is a genuine a difference of opinion between uh, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak on this, that, that Rishi Sunak accepts the need for this these bold, big interventions, uh, Liz Truss has put her emphasis on this tax cut. And it's important for your viewers to understand what that tax cut means. For the Prime Minister, whoever the Prime Minister is, that would be worth £1,800 a year, a considerable sum, up to the, the scale of the increase in bills. For somebody working full-time on the national living wage, it's worth less than £60. So we need more and bigger direct uh, interventions to support people. And that's why I was somewhat concerned by the, the position announced uh, on Saturday in the Financial Times by, by Liz Truss. Again, it's not entirely clear what, what the position is now on that. I mean, you're not clear. I, I don't know if we're clear. We're going to speak to Brandon Lewis uh, later in the programme to find out exactly what it is. So you think just Liz Truss just doesn't get the scale of the challenge we're facing? I think uh, Liz Truss is a very um, capable person. I've had the pleasure of working with her for a number of years. This is not a, about a personal thing. This is about judgment, though, as uh, a leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister. And I think what you've seen with Rishi Sunak is the judgment that he showed when he dealt with the COVID crisis. It's that kind of big intervention that is required. And my concern is that if we simply rely on a reduction in the national insurance contribution, Rise, then that is not going to help 
the neediest people, but it will help uh, people on higher incomes. It won't, for example, help pensioners. No, it won't. Let's just uh, talk a little bit about Rishi Sunak. Of, of course, you would have seen uh, for the past few days this video doing the rounds on social media <laughs> of Rishi Sunak speaking in Tunbridge Wells, talking about making sure that money would be going to uh, areas like that, taken away from deprived communities, making sure it was spread out evenly. I mean, that has left, I think, a bit of a, a sour taste in his mouth. Let's, uh, in, in voters' mouth. Let's have a listen to that. I manage to stop changing the funding formulas to make sure that areas like this are getting the funding that they deserve. Because we inherited a bunch of formulas from the Labour Party that shoved all the funding into deprived urban areas. Then uh, they, you know, that needed to be undone. I started the work of undoing that. I mean, he said he's going to undo that. I mean, that might play well in Tunbridge Wells. Probably doesn't play well in places like Darlington, where he's going to be later in the week. And it certainly wouldn't play well if he came up against Labour in a general election, would it? Well, I think the, the point that Rishi was making, with which I agree completely, is that we need to focus resources on when they're, where they're most needed. And it's quite easy... So now, if you just to... let me finish this point, it's quite easy to dismiss the south-east of England and say there's not a deprivation there. If you take my own constituency of Hartsmere, it has some of the most affluent places in the country in it, but right next door, in the same constituency, uh, one of the wards is in the 10% the of most deprived wards in the country. Now, it's right that places like that should get support as part of levelling up. And that's precisely what uh, Rishi Sunak has been saying. And I think what you saw under the Labour Party was large amounts of, of resource going into inner cities and ignoring those areas of deprivation that exist across the whole country. And I think it's, it's perfectly right that Rishi Sunak changed the formula in that way. So many should be going to leafy places like Tunbridge Wells as opposed to places that are, are perhaps more urban? It, it needs to be in the, the most needing places, and that doesn't just have to be in urban inner city areas, and I see that in my own constituency. Why do we think that Rishi Sunak is behind in, in many of the polls that we're seeing right now, then, Mr Dowden? Well, I, I've been in politics Don't for many years. Don't tell me you years. can't trust the polls. Well, I'm not saying you can't trust the polls. What I am saying is we have seen time and time again that polls have not proved to be correct, whether that's in relation to Brexit, Donald Trump, you, you, you name it, all different polls come out. The key thing is the members. I trust the members of this, this party. I work with them incredibly closely as chairman and over many years. I know that in the end, they'll look at the candidates and they can see in Rishi Sunak someone with the values, with the experience and the capability to lead our nation. OK, Oliver Downton, uh, former chair of the Conservative Party. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay. Now, the Financial uh, Times. Uh, let's look at the papers now. And start with the Financial Times, which leads with the Conservative leadership candidate Liz Truss appearing to contradict herself over whether to offer cash handouts to people struggling with the cost of living crisis. As I just said to Oliver Dowd, we'll check that with Brandon Lewis when he's on the show a little later on. That's also the main story for the Daily Express, which says that Miss Truss has not ruled out offering more help to people. The Times has a poll which suggests voters want candidates to control inflation before cutting tax. And the mirror goes with that call we were talking about there from Gordon Brown for the government's emergency COBRA committee to hold daily meetings to deal with the crisis that many families are facing. Now, The Guardian says it's seen leaked documents which suggest that the Justice Secretary Dominic Raab wants to make it harder to bring legal challenges against the government. And the Daily Telegraph carries a warning from the Health Secretary that action needs to be taken immediately to prevent a winter crisis in the NHS. And finally, according to the Daily Mail, Conservative MPs investigating the Prime Minister over Partygate have been urged to quit what his supporters call a kangaroo court. Well, still to come on the programme, at half past seven, we'll be speaking to the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown. But what more he wants to see from the government to deal with the cost of living crisis, including those daily meetings of the Emergency Cobra Committee. And at a quarter to eight, I'll be joined by the former president of YouGov, Peter Kellner, for our polling pit stop. And I'll also be speaking to a 10-year-old girl from Afghanistan who shares her experiences after her family fled here to the UK a year ago after the fall of Kabul. Now, the United States Senate has passed a bill which will pump more than $400 billion into the fight against climate change. The US is the world's second biggest polluter, and Democrats hope that the bill will cut the country's greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by the end of the decade. David Blevins reports. Death and destruction in Kentucky. The flash flooding there last week, illustrating the scale of the climate crisis facing America. 
It's an issue coast to coast, but there haven't been any serious legislative approach to tackling it for 34 years. With the Senate evenly split, the Vice President arrived to exercise her crucial casting vote. The yeas are 50, the nays are 50. The Senate being equally divided, the Vice President votes in the affirmative and the bill, as amended, is passed. <laughs> It's the largest investment any U.S. government has ever made to counter global warming, nearly $400 billion over 10 years. Big tax breaks for those who switch to green energy and penalties for companies who fail to reduce their emissions. The Democrats pushed it through despite fierce opposition from Republicans. Even though I prefer to work in a bipartisan way when it's really important and the Republicans won't participate, we have to do it on our own. And that's the opportunity, even with 50 votes, that reconciliation affords us. And that's what we, that's what we used. As wildfires continue to rage in California, the battle goes on between environmentalists and the fossil fuel industry in the United States. But President Biden's climate commitments are back on track. A big boost for the White House, with midterm elections looming. David Blevins, Sky News, in Washington. Well, now to the growing rift over Taiwan. The country's defence ministry says it's detected 66 Chinese planes and 14 warships taking part in live fire exercises over the weekend. Now, they've accused China of behaving like a bully. I'm joined now from Taipei by the reporter for Taiwan Plus, James Chater. James, good to have you with us again. So just tell us, how has this weekend been? These uh, exercises are continuing on. Um, how are people on the island feeling? Well, people, you know, remain remain relatively calm. Um, we had the official conclusion of these drills at midday yesterday. Um, but, you know, after that, the Taiwanese Defence Ministry was coming out and saying that the airspace around Taiwan had returned to relative normality. However, today, Chinese officials now saying that drills are continuing around Taiwan, the Eastern Theatre Command. That's a part of the Chinese military that has really been the driving force of a lot of these drills, saying on social media that they will continue anti-submarine and sea raids. The location of these drills is still not known, um, but Taiwan's defence ministry is going to have a press conference within the next hour or so to discuss this. All of this comes after China saying yesterday that they would be continuing drills along the, the median line of the Taiwan Strait. That's the body of water that separ separates Taiwan from China. Um, and also more drills are going to be taking place in the Bohai Sea and the Yellow Sea off China's northeastern coast. Speaking to some of the defence analysts, we're basically hearing now that this is going to mark a new kind of phase in terms of how China seeks to prosecute its, its military and intimidatory military tactics towards Taiwan. From the perspective of Beijing, they will argue that they're kind of justified in doing this because, you know, from the perspective of Beijing, the US sending Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan was itself a violation of that policy. Um, I think, you know, the concern of, of um, Taiwanese officials is that the visit of Pelosi is going to set up this kind of situation where there's a kind of point of no return. And, you know, that China is going to have to ramp up this type of military intimidation because, you know, if, if they don't keep the, the pressure at this level, um, the military deterrence and trying to dissuade other foreign officials from travelling to Taiwan is going to start to lose its teeth. So, you know, P Pelosi's visit, we're really starting to see now the dust has settled on this trip, that the longer term effects of um, what this trip and, and the live fire drills that followed it are really going to be doing. And a lot of analysts saying that we're, we're starting to see a new normal across the Taiwan Straits. New normal indeed. OK, James Chair in Taipei. Do appreciate that. Thank you. Now, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says that a recent attack on a nuclear power station in Ukraine is suicidal. The Zaporizhia nuclear power station came under fire late on Saturday, and both the Ukrainians and Russia accuse each other of being responsible for it. People in Kenya will be heading to the polls tomorrow as they look to elect a new president. The race to replace President Uhuru Kenyatta is likely to be a close contest between Raila Odinga, the longtime opposition leader, is making his fifth run for the presidency, and William Ruto, Kenyatta's deputy, who previously had a falling out with the president. Now, police have arrested a fifth man in their investigation into the disappearance of the student nurse Awami Davis. She was last seen a month ago 
while in South London. Well, joining me now is our correspondent, Madeline Ratcliffe, for more on this. Good morning to you, Maddie. So, uh, what's going on with the investigation? Just tell us where we are right now. Good morning. Well, Awami Davies was seen on this road, at Derby Road in, in Croydon, South London. She was picked up um, in the early hours of the morning on the th Thursday, the 7th of July, by CCTV in a shop and also by the CCTV camera you can see behind me here on Derby Road. Um, and she was seen in that uh, CCTV. The police have since released those pictures as part of their investigation. Um, there was a later uh, that morning, 7 a.m., an unconfirmed sighting of her as well on nearby Clarendon Road. But um, that was three days after she left her family home in Essex. And the Metropolitan Police's Specialist Crime Unit is now investigating, trying to work out what happened to her a month ago now, over a month ago. Um, they have now arrested a fifth person as part of those investigations, a 27-year-old man on suspicion of kidnap. That brings uh, the total to three people arrested on suspicion of kidnap, two people arrested on suspicion of murder, and four of those people have now been bailed. Um, but the police say they are still investigating. It is a very complex case. Um, they are trawling through CCTV, they say, but they have renewed their appeals to members, members of the public for information. OK, Madeline, for now, thank you so much. Now, children's charities say they are horrified after it was revealed that more than 600 children were subjected to strip searches by the Metropolitan Police in the past two years, many without an appropriate adult being present. Emma Birchley has this. The case of Child Q prompted protests and a serious case review. No justice, no peace! Why was a 15-year-old black girl strip-searched by the Metropolitan Police at school without an appropriate adult present? But data released by the Children's Commissioner for England has revealed that hundreds of young people go through such intrusive searches each year, often unaccompanied. A strip search is, you know, your most intimate parts are searched. For any child, that's going to be traumatic and concerning. Um, and so I think it's for safeguarding. It's absolutely clear that an appropriate adult should be there. It's actually a legal requirement, except in the most urgent of cases. But between 2018 and 2020, 650 children aged 10 to 17 were strip searched, 58% of whom were black. 95% were boys, and on nearly a quarter of occasions, an appropriate adult was not present. In fact, in 2018, more than two-thirds of those strip-searched alone were black boys. The numbers are so high because they demonstrate that there's an issue within the Metropolitan Police and its treatment of black communities across London. Unfortunately, young black children are not afforded innocence and the same rights as their white pairs, and... I'm unsurprised by these statistics, but incredibly horrified. In the Child Q case, four officers are being investigated for gross misconduct. The Metropolitan Police says it's progressing at pace to ensure that children subject to intrusive searches are dealt with respectfully. And new measures are being introduced, requiring an inspector to give authority before such a search can take place. Solicitor Kevin Donoghue has represented children who've been through the experience. There is a violation uh, by police officers which is very severely felt and one of personal integrity and their bodily autonomy which has been invaded and it is an event that cannot be undone. In more than half of all child strip searches, no further action was taken it's left the Children's Commission a questioning why so many are carried out in the first place. Emma Birchley, Sky News. And we're going to be speaking to the Children's Commissioner, Rachel D'Souza, later on this morning. On to some of today's other headlines now. And investigations are continuing into the death of an 11-year-old girl who went missing at a water park on Saturday. What happened is being treated as unexplained. The park, Liquid Leisure, in Windsor, remains closed. The former Manchester United star Ryan Giggs goes on trial today, accused of assaulting his ex-girlfriend and controlling and coercive behaviour. Mr Giggs pleaded not guilty to all charges against him in July of 2021. Around 70 firefighters and 10 fire engines tackled a large fire in West London on Sunday. Smoke could be seen from planes landing nearby Heathrow. 60 people were forced to leave their homes. The cause of the fire is not yet known. 
The school's minister, Will Quint, says that England must maintain the value of qualifications as exam results are expected to fall. The government is predicting very few schools and colleges will top their 2021 grades, which were awarded by teacher review due to the pandemic. Mr Quint says that young people, universities and employers still believe that exams are the best and fairest method of assessment. Well, uh... I'm pleased to say that the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown joins us now live for more on his plans to try and deal with the cost of living prices. Gordon Brown, good morning to you. Thank you very much for being with us here on good Sky morning. News. So, first of all, what would be achieved by holding daily emergency COBRA meetings? Well, we've got an um, energy crisis, we've got an inflation crisis, we're going to have a National Health Service uh, waiting list uh, crisis. What a COBRA meeting, and that's the emergency committee that we hold when things are difficult, has got to do is ensure there's enough energy for the winter, ensure there's enough storage facilities, ensure that uh, um, we can uh, uh, get the cost of living help to people because we've only seven weeks to go before October the 1st. You've got to change the universal credit computer to enable it to make payments to people. And there's no doubt that people are going to go without food and they're going to go hungry and cold in October if we don't take action now. So this is the time to take action. And that's why I'm saying that uh, the government ministers should be meeting with the two leadership candidates so that they can agree a package that could be implemented immediately. If not, Parliament should be recalled to look at what is a national emergency. And at the same time, of course, uh, the special committee should be meeting to look at all these plans. Uh, you know, you could be looking at a cap on energy prices. You could be doing what Norway does and say we'll pay 80% of the increase in bills. Or you could have uh, better social security support. But all these things are not really being discussed by government ministers at the moment, not even the leadership candidates who are obsessed about tax cuts. We've really got to deal with this cost of living crisis, the supply of energy, shortages of uh, storage facilities, but also deal with the cost of living costs that people are having to pay. Now, they're saying that, of course, that when whichever one of them takes office, comes into office, they will address it then. This trust says there'll be an emergency buzzer. And um, Rishi Sunak says, as Oliver Dowden just told us, that all measures um, will be taken when necessary. Why do you think that during the campaign but, more of this that, hasn't been made? But that's too late. But that's too late. Yeah, that's too late because you need this time now to make decisions if you're going to affect things on October the 1st. It takes weeks to change the benefit system and undoubtedly we will need to pay people more money. So if you have a budget, let's say in the second week of September, you might get benefits to people before Christmas. Uh, if you have Rishi Sunak's uh, plan that he's going to look at it later, uh, then it will be too late. Uh, the Prime Minister, I understand, is now back from holiday today. Uh, the Chancellor should be there and they should be talking to the two leadership candidates and agree a package now. If they agree, as they're now agreeing, then this has started over the weekend, that there is action that has to be taken. It should not wait uh, for another month or two. It should be taken now. Um, what are you saying to the Labour Party, of course? Because uh, as a former Prime Minister, uh, Mr Brown, uh, while your words are very well respected, obviously you can't influence what the current party is doing. What can you? What are you saying to the current shadow cabinets? What do you want to see them doing? Well, of course, they are saying that there's an urgent uh, crisis and uh, things have got to be done. And they have proposed a series of measures to deal with the heating crisis. What's happened, however, which makes it urgent in the last few weeks, is that we now know that heating bills are going to rise even faster in October and then again in January. So we're dealing with the severity of the crisis, 15 million households to be hit. Uh, we're also dealing with the scale of it, that some households will lose about 35 to £40 pounds a week, they'll be short in having to pay their bills and will be unable to pay their bills. And, of course, we're dealing with the social consequences, children in care, homelessness, mental health problems, all of which will cost money if we don't take action to try to alleviate some of these anxieties. You know, I talk to charities in my own area here in Scotland quite a lot, and they are dreading October. They are stocking up on uh, duvets and sleeping bags and hot water bottles and sheets and pillows and blankets because they know that people can't afford to heat their homes anymore and the best we can hope is people heating themselves. I talk to churches and faith groups and to their great credit, they're thinking of opening their church halls as heating hubs so that pensioners, instead of freezing at home, can have a warm place to go to. Now, if charities uh, and organisations in the community are taking 
urgent action to do something, I think it's about time the government responded. The vacuum at the centre of government really has got to end. I mean, you made that very clear, Mr Brown, but if, if you were in Downing Street right now, what would you do today, this week, to make a real difference to those people facing those catastrophic bills on the 1st of October? Well, the first thing I would do is uh, call the meeting together with the leadership candidates because they've got to approve what the Prime Minister would be proposing. I think the Chancellor's got to be back so that we do... First of all, we look at what we can do to help people uh, pay the bills over the winter. We know that they're going to be short of maybe up to £1,500 this year, and that's uh, some of the poorest families in the country. We know that tax cuts will not make the difference because they go to people who have got the most money, not people who have got the least money. So I would be talking about changes in the universal credit system to give people the money that is uh, necessary. And I would be talking about potentially capping energy bills. And that would have the effect of getting inflation down as well as, of course, uh, of helping people in the greatest need. But none of these things seem to be being discussed at the moment in the way they should be. And it really is not good enough for leadership candidates to go around the country and say, I'll have a plan next month, the month after. This is the crisis that's got to be addressed now if we're going to help people by the 1st of October. So my measures about uh, changes in the benefit system, uh, helping uh, particularly families with children and pensioners and disabled people who've lost out from Richie Sunak's previous packages, uh, and, of course, uh, looking at how we can deal with the energy companies. Now, if you want to pay for it, uh, I would say that the windfall tax could raise £15 billion uh, when the government is only proposing to raise £5 billion. And that's because Richie Sunak built in all the opt-outs for the energy companies if they invested more and so on and so forth. Let's just get the money in uh, because there are excess profits that are windfall that are not due to the success of the companies but due to the changes in the energy market. And that's something that they should not necessarily benefit from but the public should get the money instead. So changes to the benefit system I took from that. You want to see an increase in the amount that the poorest households receive. And you're going to pay for it with another windfall tax. I mean, it's hard enough getting the government to agree to the first one. Another one at this stage? No, it's the same windfall tax. It's just removing all the opt-outs. What Richie Sunak did, uh, rather stupidly in my view, was said, I'll agree with the Labour Party who's proposed this windfall tax. We'll put it at 25% as they propose, but we'll give companies the opt-out that they can claim all their expenses against this tax, with the result that he's reduced the value of the tax from $15 billion to $5 billion. Now, $10 billion uh, could give people on universal credit a huge amount of additional money over the winter months to be able to cope with these heating bills. You see, what's actually happened, let's be clear about this, the government, in many ways to the credit, have offered £1,200 to families in greatest need. But that's not enough because they lost £1,000 when universal credit was taken away. Benefits are only going up 3%, but inflation's 11%. So that's roughly another £1,000 lost. And now we've got these big rises announced last week that are going to happen in October and January in heating bills. And that's at least another few hundred pounds. And so anything the government has done has already been wiped out and they have got to do more. Now, other countries, I look at Germany, at France, at Spain, at Portugal and Norway, and they're doing more than we are doing, and it's about time that the government took action. And the only time that really matters is when you're planning for the winter months. It's too late if you do the changes in November or December. You've got to help people in October so they're not going hungry, uh, and children will go to school ill-clad and undernourished if we don't do something about it, and pensioners will have to choose between feeding themselves and feeding their gas and electricity meters. And Mr Brown, you said that we're expecting a financial time bomb to go off on the 1st of October. Obviously, you were in office where a, another financial time bomb, or not even time bomb, a time a bomb went off while you were in office and you, and you guided the country or were helping the country through that. So would you like to return to frontline politics now, do you think? <laughs> No, I think when you're out, you're out, and you've got to accept that uh, that's what's happened. But I, I do feel very strongly about this. You know, I, I live in the place I was brought up in, in Fife, in my county, and I am seeing poverty that I did not expect to see ever again in my lifetime. You know, I grew up in a mining and textiles town which went through a, a long period of unemployment, and now, unfortunately, we're back to some of the conditions we saw then when people uh, have not the money to turn up the heating, uh, when they're having uh, to tell their children they cannot give them basic necessities, when people are in charities. And, you know, in my uh, town and county, people don't have a lot, but they help people with nothing. 
but the people who don't have a lot are also running out of money and not able to help. So food banks need more help, but they cannot do it on their own. Charities cannot solve this problem on their own. No matter how well-meaning they are, it's really up to the government now. And in every other country, there is a recognition of this crisis, and people are acting now, and it's time for this government. Uh, no matter what's happening in the Tory leadership contest, they should all get together and see if they can agree on a programme, but it's got to happen in the next few days. I just want to push you a little bit on that, if I can, Mr Brown. I know important duty is to you in service, and uh, your experience may well be essential at this time. So if you were asked to come back in, would you? <laughs> it's not going to happen. I mean, uh, you just heard Oliver Dowden on your programme this morning uh, making all sorts of party political allegations against me, which are completely wrong, of course, but I know them because what I'm interested in is what is in the interests of the people of this country. And I can help, and I'm working with local charities to do so, but the most important thing is that those who have got elective power for the time being that they take the action that is necessary. You know, it's ridiculous at the time of this crisis that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have both been on holiday, the Foreign Secretary and Richie Sunak, the former Chancellor, on the campaign trail, and nobody seems in charge. Now, of course, uh, I, I could walk in tomorrow and say, this is what the COBRA committee should do, and I'm telling you what I think it should do. But, of course, I'm realistic enough to know that the Conservatives are in power, and it's their turn to take the action that is necessary, and if not, make way for Keir Starmer, who's ready and waiting to do good things. And would you work for Sir Keir Starmer, then, Mr Brown? Uh, Keir Starmer is uh, going to be a great uh, Prime Minister of this uh, country, and I think everybody knows he's a person of integrity. Uh, he's made the right uh, decisions uh, to rejuvenate the Labour Party, and I think he is the person that people can turn to with a great deal of hope, as well as a huge amount of trust. And would you work in a cabinet that he set up, sir? No, I'm not going to be invited back, but uh, obviously I'm here to help and uh, I, I'm, uh, you, you know, too young to be an American politician when you look at the ages of American politicians, but I know that uh, it's, uh, it's time for other people to take their helm. And look, the team that Keir Starmer is bringing together is, uh, is incredibly impressive and uh, I think you can look forward to something uh, in our politics that will make a radical change in the way that we do things. You see, what I find uh, uh, amazing at the moment is there is a huge crisis. We had COVID, we've got obviously to recover still from that and the National Health Service also needs uh, urgent attention about how we can avoid these winter crises and the, the big waiting lists. But it does need the people who are in power to get together to do it. And, you know, this cannot uh, uh, be happened quickly enough. It's got to happen now. OK. Uh, Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister, of course, former Chancellor of the Exchequer. I do appreciate your time this morning, sir. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. All right, let's bring in our political correspondent, Mari Aurora, and the former President of YouGov, Peter Kellner, who are listening into that with me in the studio. Mari, Peter, lovely to have you with us. Peter, we'll come to you in a moment. Mari, first of all, what did you make of what you heard from Mr Brown? Well, it was very interesting, uh, some of the things he was talking about when you asked him, when you pressed him on how exactly he would uh, not just pay for uh, those uh, new measures he wants to put in place. So we talked about universal credit and how he would change that system uh, and how he wants to pay for that, not for the new windfall tax, but with changing the old windfall tax that he says Rishi Sunak uh, didn't implement properly. Well, the enough. Stupid, the stupid yes, idea. Yes, stupid. But that was to encourage says. investment, the reason that carve out was put in place, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. And I think that was what. Uh Rishi Sunak and the Tory party were concerned about when they were thinking of implementing this uh, windfall tax. So it's not surprising, otherwise people might get to the point where they say, well, what's the difference between Labour and Tories? And Tories are very worried about that windfall tax and, and having to kind of U-turn when they said they weren't going to. Uh, so it was a very interesting uh, little interview there from um, Gordon Brown. Obviously, we know he's told you he's not going back into politics, but it, the, the thing that I find interesting is... We have a former Prime Minister, Labour Prime Minister, trying to inspire change, trying to put pressure on the government to do something, yet Keir Starmer not necessarily making the same level of waves. So I think some people might think to themselves, OK, well, Labour should be in a very good position now, and they're not. And they're not doing that well in the polls. 
they're not that well known and that popular with the public. Why is that? And someone like Gordon Brown, obviously he's saying that Keir Starmer's team are very impressive. Uh, and then he, I mean, he's a quote here, he's talked about, uh, you can expect radical change from Keir Starmer mm. were he to be prime minister. Now, I think some people might find that a bit of a stretch because I think radical is probably not one of the words not everybody would use to describe Keir Starmer. So I think this, in a sense, could be a very friendly push mm. to Keir Starmer to really get out there, show the nation uh, what he's made of, show the nation his vision. And if he really wants to be taken seriously in the next general election, there are potential whisperings around a, a snap election in the autumn. We don't know if that's coming. Obviously, Liz Truss has ruled that out. Uh, but I think uh, it might be a gentle push to uh, Keir Starmer to uh, essentially try and inspire the nation a little bit more and get out there. Just a thought from you on what we heard from Oliver Dowden as well before we spoke to Gordon Brown. He was very critical of Gordon Brown's uh, financial credentials. Um, nice. uh, and also, obviously, was full-throated in his support for Rishi Sunak and his plan, as opposed to the plan we're hearing from Liz Truss. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a bit of a dig there to uh, Gordon Brown. Obviously, understandably, he's a Tory and Gordon Brown's uh, Labour Prime Minister. But he talks about kind of reinstating trust and honesty uh, in uh, a new Prime Minister with Rishi Sunak. We can take a look at this clip and he explains what Rishi Sunak's vision is. I think we need to take bold and direct action in response to this. And I think uh, you've seen from Rishi Sunak when he was Chancellor, both in response to the furlough scheme, uh, when he came up with that in a matter of days that saved millions of jobs, and the action he and uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson took earlier this year. It's that kind of scale of intervention that is required. Well, let's bring in uh, Peter Kellner now for more on this. I mean, that's the line coming from the camp, the Sunak camp. But let's look at some of the latest polls, mm. Peter, because it doesn't really bear out that that message is getting across to those who are going to be voting. But that's right. Um, opinion in their fortnightly poll for yesterday's Observer uh, asked people who they thought would make the better Prime Minister, Liz Truss uh, or Rishi Sunak. And the figure was absolutely decisive. It was more than two to one in favour of Liz Truss. There we are, 48%. Liz Truss, 22% of Rishi Sunak. This is Conservative voters. Now, Conservative voters, of course, don't have a vote in the leadership contest, but what is interesting right. is the ratio, a bit over two to one, is pretty well identical to the two surveys we had last week mm -hmm. uh, of Tory party members. And the second thing is that other opinion re uh, figures, uh, results, show a clear move amongst voters towards Liz Truss over the last fortnight, which is exactly what the polls of Tory party members have shown. So all the data, from however it's done and with whomever it's done, is moving in the same direction. And Liz Truss is pretty well out of sight. I mean, uh, would we, would we put that down to just the way that she's pulling away from Rishi Sunak right now? I think what it is, um, it, it's to do with character, actually, more than policy. You, what is interesting to us, who are, those of us who follow politics professionally, is we see a battle for the Conservative Party about two different kinds of right-of-centre politics, and therefore the result is, is profound in its impact on British politics. But the people who are voting, I think, on the whole, what, 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 what comes through clearly from the polls is that people think, Rishi Sunak think he's... He's decisive, he's competent, he looks like a prime minister in waiting. But they don't trust him. Right. They don't think he's in touch with ordinary voters. And those are the two things where Liz Trust scores very highly, whether you talk to party members or the general public. And at the moment, with all, everything that's going on, with, with energy uh, prices, inflation, tax and so on, voters and party members really do want somebody who they think is on their side. And that's where Liz Trust scores. Let's have a look at that. Sorry, Mary. I was going to ask a question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so, with the Liz Truss and the fact that she's coming out on top mm -hmm. of honesty, do you think uh, those two U-turns that she's been accused of has negatively impacted her campaign, or does it look like in the numbers, not at all? My honest guess is that that has been noticed by far fewer people right. than we who report these things. I'm sorry if this depresses you, because you've been, <laughs> you've been saying this day after day, but I'm not sure these kind of things really strike through. They can if they keep going for three or four days, but the Liz Trust U-turn, you know, it lasted, what, 24 hours? OK, let's have a look at uh, the cost of living crisis and, and how it's uh, mm. affecting the way people are feeling about it. This is the impact of inflation. Bring up these numbers here now. Talk us through the... the Right, figures we've got here, Peter. But how are they coping uh, with, with um, household budgets? And you see a third are either not coping at all, 7%, or struggling, 26 Add those two together, 33%, a third of the public. That's a big number. But in the Midlands and North, the figure is not 33%, adding those two together, 
but 46%. Mm -hmm. So think about the Reds' wall seats, which the Tories are desperate to hold on to. This is a real problem across the country and a devastating problem in the seats the Tories must hold. And does it tell us as well anything about the way that voters feel the candidates are actually trying to address these concerns? Well, this is where Liz Truss, I think, scores, because... I think a lot of voters, a lot of top Tory party members, fairly or unfairly, think that somebody who's a multi-millionaire worth hundreds of millions of pounds can't possibly really grasp what it's like to be struggling with energy bills that are going up to 2,000, to 3,000, up to 3,500. And they do think Liz Truss gets that. Yeah. And Liz Truss is, if you like, backstory growing up in a comprehensive school in Yorkshire and so on. That does chime with the people who are making this uh, decision. Let's look at the, uh, our final uh, bit of polling from over the weekend. This is on the front page of The Times. This is all about uh, what is most important for the next Prime Minister to do. I mean, 64% think that they should get inflation under control. But you, you, this is fascinating, because you think on those figures, Rishi Sunak will be walking away mm. with this context, because that's his message. You know, the 64% agree with the view, let's get inflation under control and then think about taxes. So why is he behind? There are a couple of reasons. The, f the first is that you gave the same question to Liz Truss supporters, find that um, it's almost half, say, reduced taxes, not 17%. So that's going down better. The, and the second thing is that Liz Truss is denying that's a trade-off. Mm -hmm. She's saying, in effect, we can both cut taxes and keep inflation down. And I think a lot of people feel that, to, you know, that, that um, if there's going to be a trade-off, they want inflation first. Mm. But Liz Truss is saying you can have your cake and eat it. But that credibility gap in that doesn't seem to be affecting how she's well, polling, does it, necessarily? It, exactly. And this is a, comes back to a point, Colin, I made, I made earlier. This is as much about character as about mm. policy. And, um, and, and Liz Truss being on people's side and being trustworthy compared with Rishi Sunak, you know, a lot of elections, whether general elections or party elections, are often much more about the character of the contestants than about specific policies. So if people felt there was that trade-off, if everybody felt there was that trade-off, and if they felt that Rishi Sunak was just as much on their side as Liz Truss, then I think Rishi Sunak would probably be ahead. Yeah. But those two things actually don't apply. Yeah, um, Mari, go on. Hi, Rishi. When I was in Worcester with Tory party members last mm. week, inflation and tax cuts came up Never. They did <laughs> not talk about it at all. Mm. They weren't interested in it. So I'm curious to you, do, how much do we know about the demographics of Tory party and members? We've got about 30 seconds left. Just and, then, and therefore yeah. how important inflation but is to them, because that's who they need to win over. 40% of Tory party members, the people voting in this election, are over 65. They're my generation, not your generation. And they do have different priorities. After all, they're not paying national insurance, mm -hmm. for example. So, so, th so there is a demographic tilt, and they're also far more southern than, than northern. Southern and elderly, that's your typical Tory voter, and that's not the same as the country as a whole. Absolutely not. OK, Peter Kelda, lovely stuff. Mari Roy will speak to you again later. Thank you so much, both. That was a lovely discussion. Thank you. All right, now, on to the Games. And the Commonwealth Games are going to draw to a close in Birmingham today after 11 days of competition. But have the hundreds of millions of pounds it costs to stage them been worth it? Becky Johnson reports. The star of the opening ceremony, now a star attraction. The Commonwealth Games have breathed new life into Birmingham. Busy, bright and bustling. The city centre is buzzing. You can't sum it up, to be honest. This is something that has brought everybody together, as you can see, all, everybody from all walks of life, so it's fantastic. People are very hyped about this. It's, it's really good. Great for the athletes, too. England's Nick Miller taking gold in the hammer throw. The energy in the stadium for this championships has just been overwhelming. Um, I mean, the roar of the crowd is unbelievable. And it's not just the home fans, but the many visitors to the city impressed by what they've seen. Ah, oh, mate, it's fair crack during, um, during the games. Obviously, there's a bit of buzz around. Yeah, it's, it's a great atmosphere, a great city to be around. It's a lot more modern than I was thinking, to be fair, because, yeah, we've got this idea that it's really industrial. That old image of Birmingham has been replaced by pictures shown around the world of a revitalised city. I would say the Games have been huge for Birmingham. Um, it's put Birmingham on the map, not only in the UK, but more importantly, worldwide. It's shown that the city is open for business. And that business couldn't be more welcome in a city centre that fell quiet during COVID. 
we've really struggled after the pandemic, not really sure and a bit of uncertainty about how things would go. But it's been great to see the city alive and we've been extremely busy from about five minutes after we open our doors every day. So it's been great, it's been fantastic. Organisers promised that the Games would bring investment and improvement to Birmingham, but the price was high. £778 million of public money was spent delivering these games. The challenge is to make that count by building on all of this to create a lasting legacy for the future. But for now, they're celebrating success. Becky Johnson, Sky News, Birmingham.